Grace and peace to you. This is Love Notes, Daily Devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Today we continue in the 23rd chapter of the book of Acts, beginning at the 12th verse. And we're going to go through two whole chapters today. We're going to go to the 25th chapter and the 12th verse. And we're in the midst of Paul's proclamation of the ascended Jesus through the power of the Spirit to the powers that be. If you recall, he's gone up to Jerusalem. He's given his offering to the church there. He's been warned that people are out to get him. He's been dragged in front of the tribunal, and they have found nothing to make him guilty of anything worthy of death. So now the Jewish leaders that have gathered and hate Paul well, they're a little desperate, and so our section today begins with, In the morning the Jews joined in a conspiracy and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Uh, that sounds like a plot out of a made-for-TV movie or a series of some kind, doesn't it? They all take an oath together to fast and not to drink anything, until they have killed Paul. These are committed folks. They don't have any legal grounds to do this, but that doesn't stop them. <clears throat> and maybe we should stop there for a moment and realize how much this is a part of the way we humans, when our desires and our egos are messed with, fall into conspiracy theories and reject the truth. I have to say that the first place I think of looking for this kind of behavior in our day and age is, well, government, politicians. But it also happens at corporate levels and even in families. <clears throat> We're not so interested in the truth, but we want to get our way, and so we'll go to any means to get it. When do we do that? There are more than 40 who joined this. Forty is a kind of number of completion in Hebrew thought, so it's a big group. They joined the conspiracy, and they went to the chief priests and the elders, and they said, we have bound ourselves by an oath, and we're not going to wait until we kill Paul. Now, they then ask the, the priests and the elders who have a communication line open with the tribune to bring down to you on a pretext that you will interview him and interrogate him again, bring Paul down so that on the way we can kill him. Now in verse 16, we're told that the son of Paul's sister, did you know Paul had a sister? Doesn't come up very much, but obviously Paul had a family and people who were concerned about him. So his nephew heard about the ambush, and he went and gained entrance to the barracks, and he told Paul about this. So Paul called over one of the centurions, and long story short, Paul, using his status as a Roman citizen, says, uh, essentially, I've learned of this plot, and I want this young man to go and tell the tribune what's going on. And so they arranged that. And it tells us in the 22nd verse, the tribune dismissed the young man, ordering him to tell no one that you've informed me about this. He wants to undermine the conspiracy. So then he summons a couple of centurions and he says, get ready to leave by nine o'clock tonight. Uh, his orders are going to be that they get Paul out of the city safely. And so he sets up quite a party, a couple of centurions and some other soldiers and a horse for Paul to ride, and they get out of town. The report, of course, is that there's been nothing that can be brought to bear to charge Paul with anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And so they send him to Felix, who is the governor. Felix, perhaps, can straighten all this out. So the soldiers, in verse 31, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him during the night out of the prison, out of the barracks, and they let the horsemen go on with him, and they delivered him to Caesarea, where Felix, the governor, is. And he's granted a hearing. 
So the priests and the elders are summoned to come down, and it takes them five days to get there. They come down, and the long story short in this whole thing is they make their case before Felix. Once again, he's an agitator. He says blasphemous things. We don't like what he's saying. And Felix can't find anything. He asks Paul to make his defense, and Paul gives a defense that we are familiar with by now. He tells his story. I cheerfully make my defense, he begins, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over the people. You can find out. It is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And then he says, basically, I went up and I worshiped and I purified myself. He talks about the reason that he's come, that he offered sacrifices. And then he gets down to verse 21 when he says, It is about the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Remember that the Sadducees, who were connected with the priests and elders, do not believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees and the people who might believe in the resurrection don't want to hear about it because Jesus being raised from the dead would validate him as the Messiah, and they don't want that to happen. So Paul simply says this is about the resurrection of the dead. Well, Felix doesn't want to have anything to do with that. This is, this is an internal religious struggle. And so he orders the centurion to keep Paul in custody, custody to protect him, but to have some liberty and not to prevent any of his friends from visiting him. So Paul is kind of under house arrest, but it's pretty lax for him. It is for his own protection. We're then told that some days later, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he went to see of Paul and he heard him speak concerning the faith. So now we've had one occasion where Paul has told his story to Felix, the governor of Rome, who was not a Jew. This is to the ends of the earth that the story is being proclaimed. We're getting closer and closer as we go up the ladder, so to speak, to the emperor of Rome. So he tells his story. And then after he's heard the story, Drusilla and Felix go away. And we're told that Felix is a little surprised that Paul didn't offer him a bribe. Well, we're not surprised that Paul didn't offer him a bribe, are we? So now as he's under house arrest, it says in verse 27 that two years pass. Felix kind of forgets about the whole thing and then he retires, or he's sent to some other posting, and a man named Festus, Portius Festus, is appointed governor. In order to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So there's still collusion going on, but Felix won't go the whole way. Festus now inherits this prisoner. So beginning in the 25th chapter, we have a similar pattern. They try once again with the new governor to make their case, and they can't. He comes before this new Roman governor, and Paul says, Now, if I am in the wrong and have committed something for which I deserve to die, I'm not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing, if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. That was the right of every Roman citizen, to appeal to the emperor for a hearing. So Festus confers with his people, and he says, well, you've appealed to the emperor. To the emperor, you shall go. That's where you're going to head. We come now to a point where Paul has played the trump card that he has about going to the emperor, and that sets the course for what is going to come after this. Two governors have said that he's not worthy of death or imprisonment. They've protected him, but they've also tried to keep peace with the Jews. Uh, the, the political machinations that are going on uh, don't create freedom, but they create opportunity, as has happened so often in this story. Every time the people who reject Christ as the Messiah, 
Every time the people reject the idea of resurrection, every time they try to get rid of Paul, they create a situation in which by the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel gets proclaimed. That's what resurrection power is all about. Bringing something out of nothing, life out of death, opportunity over what seems to be a failure. Let us pray. Gracious God, in every opportunity, Paul sought a way and found a way to proclaim your name before any who would listen. We give you thanks, Lord, that you have put that same spirit in us, and we ask that you would well up in us the power of the spirit so that we may have courage to speak, courage to act, and courage to testify in the name of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.